All right. Okay, so today is going to be the last day that we look at reading and evaluating multiple sources. So what that means from what we learned last week is that we need to be able to take multiple texts and we need to be able to use information. Because why? why what have we learned so far about multiple texts and reading multiple texts about a topic? What have we learned so far? Why is that useful? Before we dive into our last lesson. Why is it useful to read multiple books about Martin Luther King? Why is it useful to read multiple books about World War II? Why is it useful to read multiple books about President Trump. Trump. No, next one. Let's go with that. Fine. So why is there um, use to doing that? What do you think? London? Get to know more. I like that. Emmett? Multiple perspectives. I like that. Anything else? information because remember books get updated as years go on books when they're created that's it they don't get monthly updates software updates or anything like that so you need to be able to reference your information see if it's accurate that's good anything else that we've learned so do you think it's safe to understand that to say as a summary that we get a full understanding of a of a topic when we read multiple sources. We get a complete or full understanding of a topic when we read multiple sources. Because if I just read one, I'm probably not going to get a full understanding. So our objective today is readers notice and evaluate multiple sources from differing points of view. So not every text we read is going to agree. They'll be on the same topic, but that doesn't mean they agree. Remember the water um, text we read? That was before Christmas. But we were reading how there are different perspectives on like saving the environment, right? There's different perspectives in that way. Well, the same holds true for a lot of topics in um, a very various different areas, social studies, science, etc. So perspective. What do you see? This is one of those cool little pictures, right? That everyone loves to look at. So I need you to just raise your hand. That's all you gotta do. Micah, what do you see? So you see a man. Is what you're trying to tell me? Okay. So Micah sees a portrait of a guy. What else can you see in this image, Daniel? I see a girl trying to blend in, and it looks like her hat is supposed to be the queen. Okay, yeah, and I see that now. sees a girl. It actually took me a second to find that because I didn't see that right away. So good. What else do we see, Wesley? I see a horizon. Okay, I see a horizon. Yep, I see that. Uh, Marcos, what do you see? I'm very confused. I can see both the like the village in the background and the queen and the man and the girl, and I can also see the person that's supposed to be like the queen. Good. So you see lots of different things. I like that. Brecken? Van Gogh, okay. London. A guy with green hair. Yep, so you see the portrait that Micah pointed out at the beginning. What else? Anything else that we see before moving forward? Daniel? His nose is the person sitting down. His nose is the person <laughs> sitting down, yeah. Marcos? That he has orange hair on the top of his head. Okay. So what does perspective tell us then? Based on what we're learning from this picture, what can we say about perspective, Jet? It, it means that multiple people can see multiple different angles from different places. 
Yep, same picture, but we're getting different things out of it, right? What you noticed right away might be completely different than what I noticed right away. Like, I did not see the girl right away. I saw the portrait right away. The man, and then the next immediate thing I saw was the village, okay? But you might have saw, in, maybe in Daniel's case, you saw the girl first and then saw something else, okay? Yeah. Wait, so oh, what you could girl. see is different than what I could see, right? I didn't see the girl. See the girl. Well, there you go, surprise, point it out for you. <laughs> so points of view, moving on. Sometimes people have different points of view about life and topics of discussion. Writers are no different. They're people too, okay? They just put down their points of view on paper or digital websites and all that sort of thing. When you read about a certain topic, you can expect to notice different perspectives about that topic, all right? It could be anything, a lot of different topics. So we're gonna discuss what science means. So I want you to turn and talk with another student and tell them what you think the word bias means and think of an example of what bias could mean. Go ahead and do that right now. Somebody nearby you, please. Somebody nearby you. Ten more seconds. Ten. Nine. Eight. Seven. Six. Five. Four. Three. Two. One. And zero. Okay. So you can share what you thought about it. You can share what your partners thought about it. Just share what was discussed for what you think bias means and then what the example what an example of bias could be so let's see let's start with you um i took a look at the picture first to, to look for context clues and i kind of found one bias can mean either two sides of an argument or it can mean uh, um both different opinions okay different opinion maybe and then two sides of an argument sure what else do we think Martin? when people say someone's Everybody has bias, or do you think you can be completely unbiased? I see a lot of thumbs up. That's true. Even if you don't realize it, you probably are biased in certain things, okay? Like, think about grocery shopping, practical example, right? You might be biased toward a certain kind of brand of bread. You might be biased toward a certain kind of uh, dessert that you like, or a certain sort of ice cream, that sort of thing, right? You have biases that influence your decision. And then when you talk to other people about certain things, you're gonna be biased toward that. Another excellent example, sports teams. You may be a fan of a certain team. You're going to be biased toward that team. You're going to prefer that team over other teams, right? Yes, Rachel. What about video games? You can be bi biased in that way too. There's lots of room to be biased, okay? You can really think deep about the things that you like 
And you can ask yourself, you can reflect for a minute and say, what is something I am biased about? I'm sure there's something. It could be your clothes. It could be your games that you play. It could be your teams that you cheer for. There are lots of things you can be biased about. Okay. So we're going to go into this activity here. And it's gonna, we're going to bring some social studies into the reading right now, okay? So we're going to read two different perspectives about the War of 1812. These perspectives weren't written word for word by Henry Clay or Robert Ross, okay? So don't think that these are direct quotes is basically what we're trying to put out there. So, but they are used to show the general thoughts that both of them had about the war. As we read, think about the word used and what they focus on when talking about the war, okay? Because they're talking about the same topic. They have different perspectives. So let's read Henry Clay first. For those that don't know Henry Clay, he was Speaker of the House, he was an American, all right? So he's, he's bringing on the American perspective here. We felt the honor of America was at stake in 1812. America's rights in the high seas had been ignored for almost two decades. France and Britain were fighting each other in Europe, and they hadn't allowed America to trade freely with their respective enemies. In other words, our rights as a neutral nation were ignored by Britain and Napoleon's France. Between these two countries, several hundred vessels were seized in the Atlantic. The British Navy in particular was kidnapping our sailors in international waters for years. This practice of impressment was really offensive. So to impress means you're taking. So imagine you're an American sailor riding on the seas, a British ship comes up and says, you're now working for Britain, whether you like it or not. Congratulations, you're part of the British Navy. So you have no right, you were just taken. Kind of like almost like a form of slavery, right? You just come, they take you, force you to do something you don't want to do. Moving on. Our repeated protests did not achieve any changes. I insisted that it was time to fight for our maritime rights. I openly suggested that Americans could take Canada British possession to our north to teach the British a lesson. General Robert Ross, he's from the British side. So he was a leader, one of the generals in the British Army. I led 4,000 strong British troops to America's new capital after easily defeating the American force at Bladensburg in late August. Although DC wasn't strategically important in this war, I felt that the Americans would be psychologically defeated if their new capital city was taken. I was getting ready to offer the truce agreement to the Americans in exchange for sparing their capital. But no, those Americans were both rude and barbaric. As we marched into the capital, some of the residents in the city attacked us with sniper shots. We were both stunned and angered. My horse was killed by one of those sniper bullets. I ordered my soldiers to burn down any public buildings to teach them a lesson. I was hoping that we'd capture Mrs. Dolly Madison, who's the president's wife, so that we could parade her as a prisoner in the streets of London. Anyway, we burned lots of federal buildings, including the White House. And ah, it felt so good to teach those Americans a lesson. So, thinking about bias, does the author's choice of words reveal how he or she feels about the topic? What kind of strong words do you see? Marcos or Kira? So, well, it's not, it's more so not like just one word. Um, it's not like his choice is, well, I guess it is, but during the end part of the, of the major talk, the, Brit, the British people were when the general died and I felt so good to bring them down. I feel like way she told out this he she it told out the story what kind of sounded kind of like that she liked how the white house was being burned down and how they were almost trying to capture the um president's wife okay so they wanted to capture the president's wife 
if they use the word parade, right? Parade her in the streets of London as a prisoner. Okay, so you could kind of say the feeling, the tone, right, of the text. Anything else? Amelia? Lesson. Yeah, lesson, right? They didn't both of them say that, both texts, they teach them a lesson, right? They're both trying to teach each other lessons right now. Gretchen? Strong words right there. Rude and barbaric is what the general of the, Brit of the British Army said. So that can kind of give you some certain images right in your mind of what a rude or barbaric person might be. Daniel? That's probably the tone, right? <laughs> yeah. Nowadays. Right? So let's move on. So we can kind of understand the tone, right? We can understand the words, and we can kind of see which side they're taking. Are there certain details included or left out by the writer of each side? So what do you think? Were there some details left out by the British general about the war? Were there some details left out by uh, Henry Clay, the American House Speaker, about the war? What do you think? What were some details that they left out in their perspective about the war? Marcos? I feel like didn't tell us anything, you're right. And the general, the British Army didn't tell us everything either. What did they not tell us? What did they choose to leave out in their perspective? Daniel? Right. Yeah, they didn't bother to mention that they'd been kidnapping Americans for years and forcing them to fight in, in the British Navy. So left out a pretty important detail there. What about Henry Clay? Did Henry Clay leave anything out? Amelia? Well, he didn't say that the eggs were Okay. Didn't say that part. That would be kind of an embarrassing thing to mention, right? That your capital city was burnt down. So, but I sure. What else? Anything else? Chloe? Sure, yep, Henry Clay didn't mention that part. London? Okay, okay. So why is it important to understand that writers can have bias? We understand that our friends can have bias. We understand that our parents or some other people we know and we can see and talk to have bias. But why is it important that a writer, somebody that we can't actually, we may never meet them in person, but why is it important to always understand that writers can have biases too? What do you think? What do you think, Jet? Why do you think it might be important? Can you speak a little louder? Okay, Emmett, what do you think? Okay, so yeah, back to the beginning, right? Writers are humans too. What else? Why is it important that we understand that writers have bias? London? Okay, so if you think they don't have bias, it makes the book less interesting. Sure, bias can make, you know, things interesting because typically when people are biased, right, they have strong words, right, strong passion about what they believe. So that could be true. Yeah, correct. Um, since we're in back to work, can you just keep uh, guess what uh, bias is when a lot of people write the back to normal words or say that they say that it's bad or something or say why the president should be impeached. Yeah, I like how you brought up documentaries and 
things that are portrayed sometimes as fact. Why is it important to think about writers having bias in those areas? What do you think? Oh, in those areas? I yeah. had another one. Oh, okay. Um, uh, mine was, uh, I think it's important for writers to have bias because if without an opinion, well, why would you even be writing if you're not showing people the opinion? Sure. Yeah. A lot of times, like we did with the persuasive essays, right? You guys had to have an opinion. You weren't hiding it, right? You weren't showing that you were unbiased. Marcos? So you can see a different perspective on something. Like, for example, I mean, some people might say, oh, it's a bad movie, like the Titanic and how it's And then some people say it's, it's, it's like a normal movie or like a fun movie or something. Okay. Because some people might be prejudiced and yeah. some people might be biased. And going back to Brecken's thought, it's important to understand that writers can have bias because sometimes we take things as facts, right? We take it as gospel that, oh, this is true. But it's not always. But we tend to think that way about writings more than we do people that we talk to, right? We tend to think that, oh, because it's written down, that must mean it's true. Not every time, right? A good example would be Facebook or Twitter or any of those Twitch. social media groups, right? There's lots of writing Discord. in there, but that doesn't mean that those authors are unbiased and that they really dug it out and tried to find a perfect middle ground. So you need to think about that when you're doing research and when you're reading up on things, that there's lots of bias in the world. So as you read today, I want you to look for examples of bias within your book. I know you guys read all kinds of different books, fiction, nonfiction, all sorts. But be looking for bias. If you're reading fiction, look at your characters. Do your characters have bias? What is something that they're biased about? If you're reading a nonfiction book, is there any bias in there by chance? Do you think they have a certain perspective that they're pushing, that they believe in? Okay, maybe it's saving the environment something like that, okay? So when you're going through, try to look for examples of bias today. All right, we're gonna stop the video. I'd like you guys to go ahead and get your reading materials and let's go ahead and start. You want me to press the button? Yep, that'd be great. <laughs>